the time. Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to this Plymouth Regional Update. Uh, this is hosted by PAC TV. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. We'd like to welcome all of you. It's coming to you live on April 6, 2020 at 1.30 p.m. We have a great lineup today. Uh, we're going to be joined by Congressman Bill Keating, State Representatives Matthew Muratori, Kathy Lenatra, and Josh Cutler. We're also joined by Dr. Philip Trifletti, an attending physician with Beth Israel Deaconess, Dr. Mark Wilson, also by Father John Cullody, and Dr. Russell Fry. And we're attempting to bring to you information from the region regarding our response to the coronavirus. I'd like to begin with welcoming Congressman William Ke Keating. Welcome, Bill. Bill, turn off your turn on your off your mute button. So we can hear you. Bill. Okay. Let's just see yep. if we can hear Bill. He just turned it off. Tell him to turn it back on. Yeah, it was on the first time. All right, turn it he on, was Bill. fine, Steve. Okay. <laughs> nope. We'll try one more time. There you go. Now we've gone back to the way yes, it was. Yes, welcome, so Bill. Fun? Go ahead. Now All we right. can hear you. Well, thank you. Well, Steve, I just wanted to touch base uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, hats off and our great our gratitude to all the healthcare providers that are risking their lives uh, to, to help us, uh, as well as everyone else that's there every day working, uh, doing things to keep our food on the table, making sure our deliveries are there. Uh, we're really grateful. The two questions we're getting the most in our office that surround the $2.2 trillion CARES Act that we did. It's a massive act. Uh, I never thought that uh, we'd be in a position to do the things we're doing and spending the money we're spending on this. But we, we geared in on two things right away. Number one question is the stimulus money that people are going to get. Uh, that's going to be $1,200 uh, for every adult uh, that earns under $75,000. It graduates down uh, until, you know, the high is in income. After that, you don't get it. The, the key is, when are we going to get this money? That's what people want to know. Well, uh, the Treasury is going to start the process on April 13th, about a week. Uh, and for those people that pay their IRS uh, taxes uh, or get their refunds, uh, with direct payment. That money's coming out first because they already have that. They can put that out. People will actually see the money uh, start in their uh, accounts after the 13th. Uh, and that should happen really in a, in a couple of weeks. People should be getting that. Uh, there's a, there was an issue uh, because there's the people that have that direct pay and those that don't. Now, those that don't include people on Social Security. One of the things I pushed for was to make sure if you're getting the Social Security payments, uh, and you don't, as a lot of people don't, file a tax, you don't have to, uh, then why can't that money be sent directly? Well, the Treasury changed their position uh, just in the last few days, and those people will also get those direct payments out. If you're not uh, set up like that, some people aren't, uh, then it's going to be a longer process where you do it by mail, and you can contact through our uh, Facebook account or calling our office just how to do that. Um, secondly, uh, there's the issue of uh, the Paycheck Protection Plan. Uh, I think I'm losing my power here, but but the uh, there you are still here. Okay, the Paycheck Protection Plan is the centerpiece for small businesses. There's an emergency plan I won't get into. That you can go on the SBA site and get ten thousand dollars if you need those monies right away. The Paycheck Protection Plan uh, is really a huge bailout for uh, getting people through. I call it a life preserver, really, for small businesses uh, that are laying people off, facing, facing enormous pressures. And this is how, who is eligible. For employers under 500, you get to pay, uh, you know, you get money for two and a half times your monthly payment, up to $10 million uh, in some instances. And here's the interesting part of it. It's a no interest loan that's payable in a year. But the important part is this. If you are 
February 15th to June 30th, keep the employees you had on the payroll, you'll have this money to pay them. Then that money ceases to be a loan and it is a free grant. You actually get to keep all that money. You have to lay off a few people unexpectedly during that period. It's prorated. So this is something that businesses are walking uh, to take advantage of. Uh, it's not, it's being done from the Small Business Administration to local banks and lending institutions. Check with the bank, do business with FERC, uh, because they have a history with you. See if they are part of the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, if they're not, find a bank that is. Banks only had, and lending institutions only had, maybe a one full day of businesses to have the guidelines of this sent. So some of them are still uh, getting this up to speed. Others already have this online for an application. But my strong advice is uh, this is a, a, an enormous benefit to try and at least keep your employees employed, and keep your businesses uh, functioning. The theory behind it is when we move out of recovery, we learned in 2008, it took so long for businesses that actually shuttered down and uh, almost had to start over again, uh, to start up again. Many of them are doing it. This is an opportunity to get us back and get the economy back fast. People uh, having a paycheck and to keep businesses functioning. The money doesn't have to be used exclusively for uh, you know, payroll. It can be used for other expenses as well. We have information in our uh, Facebook uh, and, uh, you know, it's available even through your local lender. So I would just want to, Steve, just address those two things of any questions we're getting. Those are the ones that uh, we're getting the most, uh, uh, you know, questions on. Thank you. That's Congressman William Keating, uh, who is a congressman for the 10th Congressional District. Uh, and he will be joined by Michael Jackman of his staff, who will stay to answer questions in our question and answer portion of our forum, uh, we're going to be joined by a number of officials as well as a number of experts, and we're going to alternate. Uh, before I go to my next expert, we've been talking the past few days about wearing either a mask or some type of uh, cloth, and uh, this is the type of mask that we're talking about uh, for us to wear. We're not talking about a medical mask. I have a photo I'm going to show, and it is a photo of my niece. Uh, Diana Trafletti, she is an emergency room nurse, and uh, she's wearing the type of mask that uh, the medical people uh, would be wearing. And I'm now uh, delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Philip uh, Trafletti, who also happens to be my brother. Uh, he is an attending uh, primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. I'd like to welcome him. Phil, good day. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me on the program today. Um, I'm going to give a very brief summary about some of the important things you should know about the pandemic. Uh, the first thing I'd like to review is about the symptoms. I think this is very important for people to keep in mind. I get a lot of questions about this from patients. Uh, you know, about 90 to 100 percent of people are likely to have fever. So that's probably one of the most important symptoms to watch for. If you're lucky enough to have a thermometer, um, that's a good thing to be monitoring yourself periodically to make sure you don't have a fever. Other common symptoms could include fatigue, um, up to 70%, cough in 60% of people, and then there's a variety of other symptoms which are less common. Um, I think one of the biggest questions that now comes up is, uh, will I have any symptoms or not? And so there is this issue of what we call asymptomatic spread of the virus. And if you look in the literature, you'll see different numbers. You know, you'll see numbers maybe quoted 15% up to maybe 30% of people that are infected might not have symptoms at the time when they're shedding virus. Uh, we don't really know for sure those exact numbers, but you know, I know from one of my uh, jobs, I, I work as a medical director for a skilled nursing facility. And although we're following precisely all the protocols, we did have a situation where a resident developed the infection, and it probably came from really one of the staff workers who came in, had no fever, no symptoms, went through the checking, and but ultimately was carrying the virus and transmitted it to a patient. So 
it is a very tricky virus that way that, you know, it, there will be times when it will sort of sneak through our, our procedures and protocols and still spread infection. Um, some people have asked me, what should I expect if I get ill? Uh, obviously, you've heard if you get mild illness, which is about 80% of people, you would stay at home. You likely would probably not take any special medication. For the 20% of people that get more severe, severe illness and are hospitalized, most of them likely would get some form of medication. Um, they would get oxygen if their oxygen levels are low. That's one of the major reasons for being hospitalized. And then, of course, in the most severe cases, people would receive support with a, a ventilator for the severe pneumonia that comes along with this problem. You brought up the issue of wearing masks, which, uh, you know, since we did this same program about two weeks ago, obviously there's been a change in that. And now the CDC is recommending that we wear a cloth mask. Uh, and as you pointed out, Stephen, correctly, we do not recommend an N95 respirator for the general public when they're, they're out in public, but uh, a cloth mask. And the theory there is that people who wear masks may not spread respiratory droplets to others that they come in contact with. Obviously, we want the social distancing of the six feet as much as possible when we're out in public. But, um, but the cloth mask, uh, although I'd say the data is probably still controversial, I think that they've gone ahead and said, you know, let's try it because it may help reduce some of the spread that's happening in the community. And we really wanna take every precaution we can to stop the spread. Uh, when it comes to the medications, I think, again, here's a lot of controversy about, um, you know, what has been proven to be safe and effective to treat this virus. And right now, the, the answer is, there really is nothing that's been proven to be safe and effective. Obviously, we have anecdotes about certain kinds of medications like the anti-malarial drug, hydroxychloroquine, and others. Uh, however, uh, we don't really have any great data yet to prove how effective these things will be. There's probably over 300 studies going on right now worldwide looking at that medication as well as other medications. So eventually we'll have more answers, but right now um, we don't really know that for sure. Uh, the last thing I'd like to say in finishing up, just that you know, I think the most important thing, and you hear from Dr. Fauci on TV all the time, how important is that social distancing, the physical distancing, that's probably our main strategy and tool for preventing the spread, the spread of this virus. And so people really should be staying at home and avoid avoiding social contacts, only having essential trips out of the home, you know, for things like groceries, uh, medicines, et cetera. Et cetera. But uh, the social distancing is very important. The hand washing is very important. So whether you have sanitizer or just using soap and water for 20 seconds, washing the entire hands, these are the very important things to do. Cleaning and disinfecting surfaces in your home that are commonly used by others in your home. Uh, so those are all the main points I'd like to make and uh, I'd be fo looking forward to answering questions in that part of the program. Thank you, that's uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti. He is a attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, for those of you that are watching in southeastern Massachusetts, for Comcast, channel 13, for Verizon, channel 43, and also you can live stream on pactv.org. This is coming to you live on April 6th, uh, 2020, and we're trying to provide you with verified information from officials and experts responding to the coronavirus. And at this time, we welcome Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. Welcome, Matt. Hey, Steve. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. I want to thank Congressman Keating as a small business owner uh, for what he's been doing and also on behalf of the residents of the Commonwealth for that the stimulus check that's going to be coming to them, too. So thank him for his work in, in Washington. And also want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Trifoletti for all you're doing and your colleagues uh, to keep us all safe. Uh, what I want to do, Steve, is just kind of quickly run through some of the numbers and talk a little bit about health and, and tourism uh, regionally. Um, as of noontime yesterday, which was April 5th, um, the total uh, cases in Massachusetts were 12,500. Uh, there were almost 72,000 people that have been tested to date, uh, 71,937. So out of the population, 
almost 7 million people in the Commonwealth. That's a little less than 12 percent, uh, 1 percent that have contract, contacted the, uh, uh, the virus. Um, also, um, to date, there have been 231 deaths and there has been 1,145 people that are hospitalized out of those 12,500 cases. In Plymouth County, we have 963 cases at this point. Now, one of the things that uh, the Congressman uh, touched upon a little, or, I'm sorry, Dr. Triple touched upon a little bit was, uh, was nursing facilities. Uh, nursing facilities are usually the folks that are hit the hardest because of the, the population. And when I talk about nursing facilities, I'm talking about uh, the long-term care facilities, as well as nursing homes and rest homes. Uh, last week alone, there were 1,237 uh, tests that were done in these facilities, um, and that was a total of 69 facilities. Uh, but more is being done. The National Guard is actually now involved with facilities, trying to test staff as well as our residents in these facilities as well. Um, to date, there are 102 facilities out of the seven, almost 700 facilities in the Commonwealth that have at least one person uh, that has been uh, effect, infected by the, the, by the virus. Um, and there's about 550 uh, residents as well as healthcare workers that uh, do have the coronavirus. Now, that's, it's, uh, it's a great, um, uh, we have a great deal of gratitude for our healthcare providers, particularly those in long-term care. Uh, that are going in and caring for these people. But this, this whole social distancing is, is because, I believe, because of our elder population. Uh, these are the people who are the most vulnerable to this disease. And, um, and, and as much as we can uh, keep them away from getting it, uh, anybody with underlying conditions, and much as we can keep them away from it, we should. The next two weeks, we're hearing that uh, through the uh, CDC, uh, through the governor's uh, healthcare team, that these next two weeks, going to be a great surge so we shouldn't be surprised to see these numbers rapidly growing but as much as we can uh, social distance from one another uh, and, and what I say daily on our daily show that we have the more we can come together by staying apart uh, the quicker we'll be able to get back to the people and the things we love to do so we really need to practice that this week um, as uh, as you indicated Steve that the wearing a mask out in public now would, would be best for everyone if you do have to go out if you have to go to the grocery store, I know there's people that like to go every day. Try to go once. Uh, try to get everything you need and, and then try to not go again um, if you can, if you can do that. So finally, on the health part, um, one thing that we are really lacking severely is, is blood and, and platelets. And I think Dr. Trifoletti would agree with this, that we do need uh, blood donors. We do need blood donors throughout the Commonwealth uh, to go to your nearest Red Cross Center uh, to give blood, or if you are a, a business owner, or you have a place that can hold the blood drive, it can be done very safely uh, for everyone. But uh, we urge people to please continue to give blood, um, and if you can hold a blood drive, please do so. Uh, also, uh, with regards to healthcare workers and first responders, there's a call out from the governor to, in, to uh, solicit volunteers. So if you are retired, or you have a healthcare background, or you want to help out, uh, the Commonwealth is looking for you to come and help work at healthcare facilities. Um, and uh, if you do, there is a website that you can actually go to. Go to uh, mass.gov backslash COVID-19. You'll find the information. Uh, thousands of people have signed up in the last week or so, uh, but still more is needed to, uh, um, to meet the need of the surge that's coming uh, this week and next week. So please do that. Also, if you have uh, personal protective equipment that you can actually... Um, uh, provide to folks, either sell or donate. Uh, again, going to the same website, mass.gov backslash COVID-19 is a great place to go uh, to either donate this personal protective equipment, masks, um, particularly, um, and other items. So please do so. Um, I do want to touch quickly, Steve, on um, tourism in our area. As the uh, ranking minority uh, member of the uh, Joint Committee on Tourism of the state, um, We've been, we had, a, we had a conference meeting last Tuesday, and um, tourism, which always includes hotels, motels, restaurants, et cetera, are being hit probably the hardest out of any industry there is. Um, and the problem is going to be not so much now uh, with, with tourism uh, throughout our area, throughout the Commonwealth, uh, but also throughout the world, is 
it's not going to come back fast. People are going to be a little skittish about actually um, traveling, um, coming to tourism destinations like we have in the Commonwealth, uh, here on the South Shore, the Cape Cod, the Berkshires, um, the North Shore, um, other areas. They're, they're going to be skittish about doing that. So the recovery for tourism is, is going to be a lot longer um, than the doors open in, say, May or June, and people are going to start coming. It's not going to happen. Um, so we are talking about things that we can do as a Commonwealth to try and um, mitigate the, uh, the loss, but also look at ways that how can we encourage tourism uh, looking at next year, 2021. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is maybe it's time to have a, a state campaign uh, for tourism that we need to start looking at that sometime this year, later this year, uh, to welcome people back to Massachusetts uh, to help the tourism industry. As we know the tourism industry is the third largest industry in the Commonwealth, um, but it's gonna be probably the one of the most uh, hit industries there is. So we really need to uh, focus on what we can do to help tourism in the Commonwealth. And rest assured, we have started doing that on state level. And I know in this area, the, on, in the uh, Plymouth area, the South Shore area, uh, we had a meeting on Friday talking about the Plymouth 400 and plans of what we can do to help make that the economic engine uh, at some point to help drive tourism back to the uh, to our area, but also to the entire Commonwealth. So uh, more to come on that um, as time goes on. Thank you. That is Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratori. You can send your questions to us today at Plymouth Info at pactv.org. That's Plymouth Info at pactv.org. Our next participant is Dr. Mark Wilson. He is an active professor emeritus from the University of Michigan School of Public Health and the Department of Epidemiology. He's also a resident on the South Shore. Welcome, Dr. Wilson. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, I thought what I'd do is remind us a little bit about the history of uh, this particular virus and that it is not a human virus. And that's important for lots of reasons, but um, this is a virus that normally is transmitted among animals. We believe that bats are the primary reservoir. So transmission normally, uh, normally occurs uh, among bats. It was spillover to people. And we are now faced with a human to human uh, pandemic that, that I think uh, is puzzling us because we're, we have not co-evolved with this virus to be able to um, understand as much as we, as we might uh, had we been uh, exposed to it for many, many years. We do have other examples of this, plenty of examples. Um, the recent SARS epidemic in 2003, uh, MERS in 2012, um, even going back further, AIDS originally was in non-humans, uh, Zika, Eastern equine encephalitis. These are all non-human transmission cycles, but not many of them have become human to human. This one has. So it presents a, uh, a particularly difficult problem for us right away because we're faced with this enormous pandemic. We don't have a vaccine and we're still learning a lot. Um, and in that context, we're trying to use modeling, and I just want to say a few words about this because there's a lot of press about it, modeling to understand what we should expect and to uh, anticipate where this virus will be going and at what rate. Um, modeling really isn't at all that sophisticated in some ways, and it really depends on the basic data that we're using. It's just simply using information or knowledge from the past to predict the future. Uh, but in fact, it's not simple because there are so many uh, indirect effects, nonlinear effects, and so forth. But we do it all the time. We, we forecast our budgets. We have many different um, uh, needs in everyday life. Uh, when do we stop at the gas station next? Is our bank account earning enough interest and so forth? Um, and this is actually something that's not new to public health. It's been used, modeling has been used for um, centuries. In fact, uh, the original smallpox outbreaks were, were modeled back in the uh, 1700s. So in this context, then we've got um, a few important characteristics for infectious disease transmission models that I would just want to mention briefly. First, we're dealing with populations, not with individuals. Unlike uh, what Dr. Trafletti just reported, talking about how to treat individuals, we're talking here about populations, groups of people, age groups, gender groups, occupations, and so forth, that are important uh, classifications that we need to consider when we're 
um, in the process of trying to analyze patterns. These are mathematical models. They explicitly account for these interactions that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, are not always exact and very often end up being um, changing with, with time as we get more information about them. Um, but they are nevertheless very scientific, systematic, and they're data-based. And so this means that we can predict sometimes very complex processes with more or less accuracy, but it's always better than our feeling or our intuition or beliefs. Well, almost always, because certainly we have to consider other things that don't necessarily go into the model. The models nevertheless will help us to integrate different kinds of information, epidemiologic information, climatic information, uh, people's behavior and so forth. So they're valuable tools in our, our battle against this and, and in trying to anticipate what we should be facing in the future. They serve different goals. Um, some of them would help us to understand the rate of increase in cases and there's a lot of discussion around, around this right now. Um, as you, many of you have heard, uh, when the peak will occur, um, how low the flattened curve will be, uh, when will the decline begin to take place and how long will it last? Will there be uh, anticipated uh, re resurgence or reoccurrence in, in the seasons or in years to come? These are all questions that models can help us to understand and give us insights into. But these models depend on the accuracy of the, of the information and so, this is why the models are changing all the time. Uh, we're fortunate in, in the world that we live in today to have very rapid uh, return of information, information that serves to change these models. And so um, our listeners shouldn't be disturbed when they hear, well, the results are, are different today than they were yesterday. The anticipated uh, peak will occur at this date rather than that date. We, we expect this many uh, beds to be needed and so forth. Those are all, part and parcel of the modeling process. So it's a dynamic ongoing process and it's one that we should have confidence in and believe that, um, as I mentioned, it's much better than uh, having just a feeling or, or, or intuition about what we should anticipate. These models need to uh, help us, to, are, are being used rather to help us to understand susceptibility, how much vaccine might be available, what might, might be needed, whether or not natural infection and so forth is, is a, uh, uh, an important component of reducing transmission. But one of the big unknowns right now is whether uh, people who have been infected, sometimes even unknowingly, as we're learning more now, may never in the near future again be part of the transmission cycle. And if that's the case, this changes dramatically uh, the anticipated future that models are predicting. So we have lots of experience with other uh, examples of models, and I'm not going to go into those details. But influenza is the best example, and there are uh, many people who have uh, studied influenza and anticipated with, with a high degree of accuracy using models. So finally, let me just mention that um, these models can be accurate for some places, but not for others. And so part of the heterogeneity that we're seeing uh, in terms of reporting, the timing of onsets, when peaks will occur, and so forth, um, this can be analyzed in a region-specific way and even down to a much finer level. I think it's really important that we keep in mind that what we hear about one region may not be the same situation in other regions. And I want everyone to, to remember that and to practice social distancing, it really should be uh, physical distancing, uh, in a serious way because this is something that uh, will certainly reduce the risk as everyone has, has shown. We're in this for the long run. This is going to be a long duration event. Uh, but at the same time, we're reducing that duration by practicing physical distancing. I'd be happy to answer questions at a later time if that's appropriate. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's Dr. Mark Wilson. He is from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology. Your questions can be emailed to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And as you can see, one of the things that we're trying to do is to provide you with verified information Officials, we have four legislators, we have experts here all talking with each other uh, as we come to bring you the information. And at this time, we're going to go to uh, State Representative Kathleen Lenatra. She represents a number of towns on the South Shore. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, again, I'd just like to echo my gratitude to all the frontline workers, our 
supermarket, uh, just doing amazing things, keeping social distancing in my district, which is wonderful. Our firefighters, our police officers, our healthcare workers. Um, I, I can't thank them all enough. But what I'm really concerned about during all of this, you know, I have four children, um, and one is a competitive athlete that her season ended, but is the mental health of our children and our frontline workers um, and people that are in recovery that aren't able to make meetings. So there are some options for them out there. We have telehealth that insurance will now cover uh, to speak with your mental health counselors. Um, their recovery, there's some great websites out there that you can do an online recovery, have a meeting online. I wanted to bring up a couple of websites. We have the um, suicidepreventionlifeline.org. Also have in the county, spc.org that has many, many options for you. Um, it's a great resource to look into. You know, whether we know it or not, we're all grieving through this. We may not realize it at this moment, but our children are grieving. They're not seeing their teachers. They're not with their fellow students. They're not competing. Um, our athletes, our senior athletes in either college or high school, their seasons have been dropped. Some of them are elite athletes. We have the Olympians. That's their life. Their, their life is their sport, and that has ended. So that can really cause a deep depression. Um, and people that are out of work, obviously, in their small business, trying to make way for their, their employees and feeling like their employees are family and having to let them go, that can cause a deep depression as well. So I want everyone to understand that there are resources out there and to reach out. I have a lot on my Facebook page that will give you the phone numbers and the websites to check in. I think it's very important that we all realize that now sooner than later. Um, one other thing I want to bring up is the real estate market. So the real estate, we are now considered real estate agents and brokers are now considered essential employees and houses are still being listed. Everything is being done remotely now. There are no open houses. You cannot have more than 10 people in a house at the same time, but it is going on. Um, you could do, I know Steve, you know this, but we do online clothing, register, register deeds is, is done online. Um, also, the inspections for the smoke detectors, we've had a new law that we can do that. We've also allowed drive-by, um, my, sorry, my dog is starting to scratch now, um, appraisals, I'm sorry, appraisals. We can do drive-by appraisals now. So that is still ongoing, which I think is very important that it doesn't come to a direct end um, when this is all over. I hope that the market still continues to grow and not get but right now, we're still continuing that business. Thank you. Uh, that's Representative Kathleen Lenatra. You can send your questions to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. Representative Lenatra did a nice lead-in to our next guest, uh, who is Dr. Russell Fry. He is a psychologist. And uh, for many of us uh, who know people who are experiencing fear and stress, and she mentioned about the mental health of our young people. Dr. Fry, what could you share with us? Thank you, Steve, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, the last time I was before this forum, um, I think it was about 16 days ago, the front page of the uh, globe on the 21st of March, one person had died. Today, 16 days later, 231 people have died. So this is not going away, obviously, the modeling that uh, the doctor talked about um, is before us. So it isn't, when I first was here, it was anxiety was the problem, meaning what if this happens? Now it is happening. And so with that, I think rather than the emotional part holding us all together, we now have a strategy. We now have a model of behavior which is intended to keep us safe, keep our neighbors safe, keep our family safe, and uh, stop the, if you can, the curve of, of this awful disease. So through social isolation, social isolation, or at least withdrawal, keeping a safe distance, washing hands, washing your groceries, et cetera, et cetera, we have had to adapt to a lifestyle that we're not used to. We can't go to work, we can't go to school. So there is an oversight of, we're vigilant about our adaptation, which makes us human, but there are also some negative side effects of that adaptation. Uh, physically and emotionally and, and intellectually. So when we're coping and we're 
under the wire and we're not living our lifestyle, the success is we're staying safe. The offshoot of that is we may develop symptoms now and or in the future because the governor wants us to maintain this quarantine until um, May 4th. So this is the long haul as has already been suggested. We might want to just mention that there'll be some physical symptoms that people who do this over an extended period of time um, have some physical symptoms. I'm not saying that they're problems, but you may notice some changes in your sleep. You may notice some changes in your appetite. You may increase some weight, lose some weight. You may have some sleep disturbance, too much sleep, not enough sleep. All those sound a lot like depression. They may be, but they're also a reaction of following the protocol, following the modeling behavior of reducing the risk. Emotionally as well, as well as physically, we can become more irritable. We can become lethargic, changing moods, highs and lows. Um, some people will become indifferent over the long haul, like who cares or, you know, I just don't have any more energy left. Um, loss of interest um, would also be what we used to do is we're not able to do. So we might not even have any energy to do any other projects around the house. Intellectually or cognitively, it's something called fog brain where we're coping well, we're doing the best we can under these circumstances, but we become distracted. We could become hypervigilant. We could lose some degree of focus or concentration. So those aren't necessarily symptoms that are gonna occur. We just would like you to be aware that that might happen. As well with the family members, monitor how they're doing as well as how you're doing. So oftentimes checking in with how you doing, how's everything going, anything I can do for you, call a neighbor, call a friend, call somebody who may be a little aged and check in with them as well. The main thing that I think um, that I wanna leave people with is the need to take care of oneself. Um, that just seems to be the modeling theme throughout, maintaining good uh, healthy habits, getting some rest, eating well, when we start to um, overacting with drugs or alcohol, and uh, just basically be aware of your own good health, which then allows people in your family to model and follow the same. So we're in it for the long haul. There will be psychological changes because this is what we're adapting to. It's not our reality, but it's the new reality. Um, any questions you have about me, uh, give them through Steve. Thank you. Thank you. That's Dr. Russell Fry. He is a psychologist. Your questions to him to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And now we're going to go to Representative Josh Cutler. Welcome, Josh. Josh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank Sometimes you. Matt likes to mute me. So welcome, Steve. It's great to be here. Thanks for, for doing this. I guess I get to be the cleanup hitter. Um, you guys have all said great stuff and enjoyed uh, this discussion. Um, I just wanted to say, put in a plug for PAC TV and for community access in general. If ever there was a situation that showed how vital having community access is, this is it. Um, we wouldn't have these kind of forums. We wouldn't be able to have live Board of Selectmen's meetings um, and have to continue the kind of engagement on a citizen level with our local government without PAC TV and without our other local cable access. So after all this is over, we'll have to remember this and make sure we continue to advocate for, for local access. So thanks for everything that you guys are doing. Uh, my great colleagues and your, your great guests have touched on a lot of things. I think the only thing I really wanted to stress, because we're getting a lot of inquiries in my office, and I'm sure Representative Lenatra and Representative Muratori are as well, is about unemployment insurance. And specifically for folks who are self-employed or what we call gig economy workers, uh, 1099 independent contractors. As folks may know, under the CARES Act uh, passed by Congress, um, traditionally those workers who wouldn't be covered by unemployment will be covered. Um, and that is a huge, great benefit for many folks. And I know there's a lot of individuals in my district and around the South Shore that fit into that category. I also know there's a lot of uh, anticipation about when that is gonna be rolled out and when that will be available because it isn't currently. Our state unemployment program is, is ongoing and if you were laid off or, or have to leave work uh, to care for a family member and, and so forth, you can file immediately. And the legislature has already waived the one week delay that you can be in existence. But we can't currently do that if you're a self-employed or 1099. We're still waiting on a few steps uh, from the federal government for some specific guidance to the states. 
And I know our Department of Unemployment Assistance is working feverishly around the clock behind the scenes to ramp up their program so that when that formal guidance is given, we're ready to go. I know they've upscaled their, their telecenters from, I think they had 50 employees before this happened to over 500 now. Um, and so we don't know a firm date when this new unemployment is going to be open to everyone who's self-employed and, and 1099, but we anticipate it'll be very soon. Uh, I would say stay tuned. Keep checking your websites and our Facebook pages and, um, yeah. and, uh, and, and Facebook as well. And um, so that, that is probably the biggest question that our office gets is when are we going to be able to apply for unemployment if we're self-employed or 1099? So hopefully we'll have some good news on that this week. Uh, only other thing I just wanted to mention is just, you know, um, I'm sure you've talked about this in the past, uh, you know, and great get job doing stuff in local government. Here in the state government, you know, we're continuing to, it's important that people know we're continuing to operate. We're having our, you know, uh, sessions. Uh, it's a little bit different than before. We still have our committee meetings. They're all done virtually. I have one later today with my committee. I know my colleagues are doing that as well. So the wheels of state government are moving forward. We're working together. I think there's a very strong spirit of bipartisanship. There always is, frankly, in Massachusetts at least. But I think it's enhanced now. And it's important that people know that, that we're working, uh, that your colleagues in the legislature are working hard and hand in hand across the aisle, both with our local officials and our federal officials. We appreciate all the great work of Congress and Keating. To, um, to do the best we can and address the challenges that, are, that we're confronting. So thanks for having us on and look forward to some great questions. Thank you. That is Representative Josh Cutler. You can email your questions to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. You've now heard from four legislators, three doctors, and at this time we have someone from our faith community because after hearing all this information, we're looking for some comfort. And we have with us today Father John Cullity. He is with the St. Mary's and St. Joseph's Collaborative. Welcome, Father John. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's good to be with you once again. Um, yes, I was thinking the other day that one of the virtues I think that we really need in our society, and this, this was a need, I think, even before the crisis of the virus occurred, is the virtue of hope. You know, they say that... Um, Bad news sells newspapers, good news doesn't. And sometimes in our busy day-to-day -day life, we forget that there's an awful lot of, of, of good that goes on that should give us reason to have hope. The big question I think for many of us is after this uh, pandemic comes to be dealt with a bit better and we get back to what we call normal, how much change will there be in our society in our day-to-day -day living? Certainly after 9-11, if you went to an airport, you realized that the effects of 9-11 continue to ripple through our society. My guess is that maybe some of the effects of this virus will continue to ripple through our daily lives as well. And so maybe some of the good lessons that come out and the reason, again, to have hope is that we've really learned in this crisis how much we depend on, on others, that we're not in this all by ourselves that we're stronger as a community than we are as individuals, and that maybe some of the things that we stopped doing years ago, uh, that family dinner, we get together with our families and the people closest to us and, and interact with their lives, maybe those are things that will continue to endure even after this crisis has passed. I'm hopeful that um, some of the experts that have spoken with us this afternoon might lead us to realize that we hope for a vaccine somewhere in the future, some way to deal with this epidemic in a very positive way. Uh, we have a lot of very brilliant people, I'm sure, that are working on these issues. It also does remind me, though, that how blessed we are to be in a particular country. There are other parts of our world where people struggle with this virus and they don't have the basic necessities of life and how difficult it is for them to negotiate uh, this virus, how difficult it is for them to negotiate their day-to-day -day living without some of the support and the gifts that, that we have in our own world. For the people of the Jewish faith, uh, for our Jewish sisters and brothers, uh, they begin on Wednesday uh, Passover. Uh, for many Christian denominations, this is what we call Holy Week. And I think for all of us, these uh, celebrations, these observances are going to be quite different this year without our congregations. But I think it is important to remind ourselves that 
if we do have the resources of, of faith, a belief system that helps us to negotiate life, it just helps us to remember that we're not alone in this world. We have one another. And hopefully our faith, which isn't any type of an insurance policy that says we're going to be protected from all difficulties, but faith reminds us that we pray that that greater power, whatever we call it, God, a uh, power that's greater than ourselves, walks with us. And hopefully we can keep faith in our beliefs, keep faith in one another, and keep faith in our hopes for the future, that in the midst of this darkness, there is reason to have hope that in the future we'll have conquered this and hope we become better persons as a result. Thank you. That is Father John Cullity from St. Mary's of Plymouth, St. Joseph's of Kingston, a collaborative. And please send your questions, plymouthinfo at pactv.org. We began with this panel uh, with Congressman Bill Keating. We're now joined by a member of his staff. I'd like to welcome Michael Jackman, who is a staff person at the office of Congressman Keating. Uh, Mike, welcome. And what can you tell us that your office is doing uh, to respond to people in connection with COVID-19? Yeah, thank you, Steve. And um, thank you for having the opportunity to sort of um, add on to the Congressman. Unfortunately, he had another call he had to jump on. I wanted to be here in case folks had questions or to sort of amplify uh, the discussion. One thing I would just say, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, piggybacking on what Representative Cutler mentioned, um, it's our understanding that the Federal Department of Labor has sent out a, some additional guidance over the weekend to the Department of Unemployment Assistance here in Massachusetts to uh, assist them or uh, guide them uh, in setting up that system for self-employed gig economy workers to apply for the unemployment insurance. They're calling it pandemic unemployment assistance that was uh, authorized by the CARES Act by Congress and signed by the, uh, the president. So we're hopeful, as Josh said, that that will be coming soon. We are hearing from a lot of folks who are eager to get that information. Um, the unemployment office, as Josh said, they've ramped up. They're doing a great job getting back to people. They're, it's really overwhelming the numbers that they're seeing uh, just off the charts, but they're doing as, as best they can to get back to people who are filing the uh, regular claims and um, and we'll be working to get that system in place to handle the pandemic unemployment assistance for folks who that's extended to, such as the self-employed independent contractors. So we're monitoring that. We've been in touch with the Department of Labor, uh, federal, and um, we're hearing from, you know, working with the unemployment assistance office here and the delegation as always uh, to try to get that in place as soon as possible. Um, only other thing I would mention is Congressman mentioned the SBA loans. Uh, people should really look into that. That's also ramping up gradually. Um, some banks were ahead of the curve, and some banks are getting guidance now this week to be able to provide those. We're hearing from a lot of folks who are similarly having issues um, getting through and getting the information they need. We're trying to connect them with uh, the SBA best bet for the uh, payroll protection program is to talk to your local lender if you have a business loan or a, a, just a, trend, a transactional account with a local bank that would be your best resource to turn to at this time so uh, we're just uh, feeling a lot of calls on these important programs and uh, trying to get the word out to uh, when we get information through forums like this so thank you thank you michael jackman he is one of the staff of congressman william keating we're now going to go to our questions, you can email us at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. The first question uh, to Dr. Trifletti, uh, and I'm not sure that you can answer this, but this is the question. When do we think that an antibody test might be available, or what can you tell us about an antibody test? Dr. Phil. Well, of course I can give you an answer. I just don't know how true it will be. But no, uh, actually, um, I've been attending conferences, video conferences at our hospital, the Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. And in fact, they do have capability they're developing right now for antibody testing. So I do think that that uh, capability will be coming, you know, in the, the near future. Uh, I do think we can count on having 
antibody testing. I think a lot of it they're going to be looking at certainly healthcare workers to see uh, if they're safe to be back. You know, taking care of patients will be one use of it, and there'll be many many other uses of it. But yes, we are we are on the the verge of developing antibody testing. Thank you. That's Dr. Philip Trifletti. He is a primary care attending physician with Beth Israel Deaconess. We're now going to go back to Representative Matthew Muratori. And a viewer asks, can you give us the statistics for people in Plymouth who either are tested positive or who might be hospitalized? Yeah, the, the number we have are for people who are infected uh, are 41 in the town of Plymouth. Uh, we don't have the number for the people that are hospitalized. But that's been 41. That 41 is is overall since this started. Um, since we started tracking numbers three or four weeks ago. So uh, some of those have cleared, but that's the total cases at this point. Thank you. Next question to Dr. Mark Wilson, an epidemiologist. And uh, Mark, I think this might be uh, appropriate for you. It has to do with the social distancing for the population. And the viewer asks, is it okay for me to work outside in my yard? Uh, with or without a mask? Is it okay for me to take a walk with or without a mask? What would you say to the viewer? Working outside in an area where there are few or no other people nearby should be fine. Um, if you're walking around, however, you want to be mindful to keep proper distance and um, especially if you're downwind of people who are uh, grouped together and nearby you. Um, I would recommend wearing a mask unless it's uncomfortable. It's a reminder to keep distance. It's also uh, a way of you protecting others. If you're unknowingly infectious, uh, even though you don't have symptoms, uh, but, but in general, I think it's, it's safe under circumstances where no one is around. This is not something that's found out in the environment. It only comes from another infectious person. Thank you. That's Dr. Mark Wilson from the University of Michigan School of Public Health Department of Epidemiology. And we're now going to go to Representative Kathleen Linatra. Uh, Kathy, you're not only a state rep, but you were formerly a town official. And one of our viewers asked, as follow-up to social distancing, uh, she commented that when she was shopping recently in Kingston, uh, your hometown, that she felt many people were not social distancing in the store. And her question is, who can she contact to express her concern about the lack of social distancing in a store in your community? Steve, I'm sorry, you said this was in Kingston? It was in Kingston, yes. Um, I would contact the Board of Health agent, who is Arthur Boyle. OK, so uh, I think what Representative Lenatra is saying, and it would be true for anyone watching, if you had concerns such as this about people not following certain guidelines, contact the local Board of Health because the local Board of Health is, has responsibility for monitoring uh, public places such as uh, stores. Correct, correct. And we have several um, markets in Kingston, so. Thank you. And that was Representative Kathleen Lenatra. Next question, we're going to Josh Cutler. Josh, you talked about unemployment. There are some people watching her and confused about whether or not to apply for unemployment if the employer is applying for one of the PPP loans. Should an employee still apply in the meantime? Representative Cutler. Sure, that's a, that's a great question. It gets kind of fact specific, um, but in general, so the PPP loan, which is a Paycheck Protection Program, which is a fantastic, um, for, it's, it's, it's called a loan, but it really is a grant because they're forgivable based on certain criteria. Uh, and by the way, I, I uh, thank you again to Congressman Keene for his great work on that. Uh, I'm just getting word that some of the banks in our area are just starting literally today to accept those uh, PPP um, applications. So if you're working with your local bank, uh, stay tuned. So it depends, you know, if you're an employer, um, part of the PPP loan, uh, getting it forgiven depends on keeping up your payroll. So if you have employees that go on unemployment, that would affect your ability to get all of the loan forgiven. Now there is there, there there is a there is a point in time in which you can rehire them back essentially and still get the the loan forgiven. So th that really gets you really kind of need to do some math and do some homework on that and look at it and talk to your lender. Um, obviously, if you're the employee, it depends on whether you're not whether you're being paid or not. 
And uh, if you're if you're not, if your employer you know pays you off or isn't paying you or can't pay you, and obviously you're going to have to pursue uh, unemployment insurance. I don't think you you have a choice. Um, but really, that really depends from the employer side on whether or not you meet the calculation to get that loan forgiven. So, uh, happy to chat offline with people who need uh, any additional guidance on that, or I know if you're a constituent or representative or not, or representative Bertoy or Congressman Keating for that matter, they'd be happy to help as well. But it's a great question. It does get very fact specific. So I'd urge you to look at the details there. Thank you, Representative Josh Cutler. Uh, we're going to go back to Dr. Uh, Trifletti, and a viewer asks, can the virus live on dog's fur? And if you get it and recover, can you get it again? Dr. Phil. So the first uh, question about living on dog's fur. So you know, we do know that the virus can survive on certain surfaces for a certain specified amount of times. Uh, I know that, for instance, cardboard's been quoted you know, to last maybe 24, 48 hours, plastic material maybe up to uh, 72 hours. So some of these surfaces can uh, maintain the virus for, for a few days. Um, I don't know the exact uh, number quoted for for animal fur, but I do believe that would any respiratory droplet, um, you know, would still probably have viable virus for a certain amount of time. And perhaps uh, Dr. Wilson could chime in if he has any thoughts on this. And Dr. Mark Wilson from the University of Michigan uh, School of Public Health Department of e Epidemiology. Mark, your comments. Yeah, I would I would agree with uh, Dr. Trifletti's comment here, and I think it's important to realize that, uh, in general, what's possible isn't always important, and, and um, it, it's certainly possible that a viral particle from a droplet that fell on a dog's fur could live for a while. The likelihood of a human then uh, caressing the dog, putting their hands to their mouth and so forth, and eventually becoming infected is quite a bit different. On top of that, there's been some discussion about the possibility that dogs or, or cats uh, in general could serve as reservoirs to maintain transmission in households. And there was a recent uh, report of a uh, tiger, I believe, or other uh, wild cats that were in a zoo that were shown to be infected. And I think it's important to recognize that that does not necessarily mean they would be infectious to people who could be part of a transmission cycle. So again, what, what's possible um, may not be what's likely or, or important. Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson. We'll now go to Representative Matthew Muratori, who's going to give us an update on statistics. Representative Muratori. Yes, thank you, Steve. So uh, the number I gave you for Plymouth that was 41 was over the weekend. But now as of today, it's 52 uh, Plymouth residents with 42 that are under uh, isolation. Thank you, Representative Muratori. We've had a panel today uh, providing you with information. We're now going to go back through the panel one more time. We'd like each of them, now that they've heard each other, uh, give us their final thoughts and the takeaway uh, for today's forum. And uh, we're going to begin with uh, Michael Jackman from uh, Congressman Bill Keating's office. Mike. Yeah, Steve, thank you. Uh the last thing I would just mention, um, which I mentioned on the Plymouth uh, update last week, is the census. Um, the 2020 U.S. Census is active now. Um, I think, as I mentioned, a lot of times traditionally we think of the census as being someone who comes to your door, knocks on your door, and fills out a survey in person. That's not going to be possible this time with the uh, with the restrictions that we're all living under. You can file the census online. You can call 844-330-2020 to, to file. You can file it by mail as well. So there are ways to do it. It's so important to do. Uh, so much of the funding that we're talking about is done on a formula basis. The town of Plymouth, the, the whole Southeast Mass region, um, the South Shore, our district, the 9th District, Massachusetts, we rely on those funds. We, so we need to be counted. Everyone needs to be counted to show that the people who, who are here are here and they deserve those funds. Uh, so the census is really important. It's available in multiple languages. If you have questions, you can go to the website, which is my2020census.gov. So 
If you're stuck at home with uh, nothing better to do, go online, find out more about the census, and uh, get it filed as soon as you can. The more people who do it online or by paper or by phone, the fewer people will have to go out door to door when those restrictions are lifted. And I know the census is trying to up the number of people who are responding at this time uh, to these uh, to, to the, the ways that they can do it remotely. So thank you. Thank you. It's Michael Jackman, Congressman Keating's office. We're now going to go uh, to Dr. Phil Trifletti. Uh, Dr. Phil, what would be a final message or takeaway you'd like our viewers to remember today? Well, a lot of what's going on with this pandemic, much of it will be unpredictable and we're not going to have all the answers, but the answers will eventually come. I, I do believe it will be ultimately a, a temporary thing for us to deal with, whether you know that's on a several month scale or on a few year scale, but we will, I'm sure, eventually develop a vaccine. Uh, what we'll need to do in the meantime, however, is really work on that social distancing, the physical distancing, because that's our primary tool for preventing the spread. And we wanna make sure we don't overwhelm our healthcare resources. And so it's really important that everyone do their part. I know everyone's making sacrifices out there, but you know, continue to make that sacrifice, try to minimize your social contacts, and that will help this problem go away much faster. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Dr. Philip Trifletti. He is a attending primary care physician, Beth Israel Deaconess. We're gonna go back to Representative Matthew Miratori. Matt, your final thoughts. Thank you, Steve. And again, thank you to PAC-TV for, uh, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, three messages, short ones. Stay informed, stay calm, stay home. Uh, stay informed by going on a mass.gov backslash COVID-19 website uh, to find out uh, all the up-to-date information, all the information over the last three weeks that we've been talking about. Um, ask questions by calling 211. You can get text alerts by texting COVID-MA to 888-777. And if you have questions on your health, uh, you can go to bowie.com backslash mass. That's B-U-O-Y.com backslash mass, stay calm. Um, you know, I've said this in the past that it's somewhat of a blessing. Those of us that have families that are at home, uh, a lot of times we're out on the road, we're working a lot and we don't have time to spend with our families. So stay calm, enjoy the time you have, uh, cherish the time you have with your families now. Um, and, and just, you know, just try to, we'll get through this, but just stay calm uh, and, and stay home. Particularly these next couple of weeks as you're hearing, uh, you know, the surges is, is here, it's coming as much as you can stay home without going out at all. Uh, enjoy the fresh air though, uh, take walks, but stay social distancing, uh, keep that in mind. And um, the, the, the more that we can come together by staying apart, uh, the faster we'll get back to the people that we love and the things that we love to do. So thank you again, Steve and to PAC TV. Thank you, Representative Matthew Muratori. Uh, Dr. Mark Wilson, what would you like us to remember from today? Uh, echoing Dr. Trifletti's comments, uh, we're faced with with a counterintuitive situation where uh, some of us, indeed perhaps many of us, may be infected, infectious, and feel fine. And we're not used to that. Normally we know when we're infected and could be transmitting to other people. That's not the case with this virus. Uh, and so treat your neighbors as if you were infectious. Uh, be mindful of that everywhere you go where you must have contact being near people and, uh, and be, be, be aware that you, you indeed may be uh, affecting the well-being of others. Thank you. That's Dr. Mark Wilson. He is with the University of Michigan uh, School of Public Health uh, Department of Epidemiology. We now go back to Representative Kathleen Lenatra. And uh, Kathleen, I know that recently you partnered with a business in order to help the public schools provide meals for children. Uh, what would be the final thoughts you'd like people to remember today? Well, there's been a lot of heroes so far, and one I'm gonna mention has been Cisco. They've helped out with the food pantries. They've helped out with the local schools. It's, they've just seriously been amazing. One of the heroes that are out there, Nathan Hale has been amazing as well with their food pantry. I delivered 40 bags of food to a senior development the other day, and it was all proceeds from Nathan Hale. Um, Matt mentioned uh, everything I was going to mention was to stay informed. Um, Mass.gov, uh, the re representatives that are here today give uh, lots of information on their Facebook pages. 
Um, and one quote that I had was April distance brings May existence. So like everyone said, we need to wash our hands and the social distancing. I know it's very uncomfortable, especially if you have children, but it's very important. Thank you. That's Representative Kathleen Lenatra. Uh, we're now going to go to Dr. Russell Fry. And Dr. Fry, we heard from some of the questions that our viewers who are watching do have concerns. They are anxious about the coronavirus. What would be a final takeaway message you'd like to leave them with? Well, I think the anxiety um, can be replaced by maintaining uh, the schedules that we are currently uh, undergoing with social uh, withdrawal. Social withdrawal and keeping distance is not social isolation. That has its own set of problems. So I think one can continue to reach out via this medium, texting, uh, a, a recent lost art, I think is a letter writing, or write a letter, or send it to somebody you haven't talked to in a while. A lot of that is just being responsible for what you're feeling inside, and we wanna maintain a healthy uh, disposition. And so part of that is monitoring our own world, our family's world, and the world of those feelings to maintain being healthy. And I think that's what we need to do to fight this disease is to stay healthy. Thank you. Dr. Russell Fry, he is a psychologist. We're now going to Representative Josh Cutler. Uh, Josh, what do you want us to remember from today? Great, thank you for having us. Uh, I think my colleagues uh, were much more poetic than, than I can be with their great advice, and I appreciate that. Uh, just two quick notes that I wanted to mention. I was thinking of things. Uh, one is absentee vote uh, every message. Everyone who in our area, please vote by absentee so you don't have to uh, have your town clerk uh, have to have an election and put folks at risk whether it's for the special election coming up or the local town election, you can always absentee, so please consider that. And the second, for all the folks who are, uh, have questions about unemployment insurance, and if you're not able to get them resolved here, please try one of the DUA town halls. They have a free town hall every day in the morning, usually online, and you can, uh, through Zoom, just like this, you can ask questions and get a step-by-step -step guide on how to file your claim. So two pieces of advice. Thanks for everybody for your, uh, Patience and uh, just be well. Thank you. Thank you. That's Representative Josh Cutler. And as we uh, finish with our panel, uh, we once again welcome Father uh, John Cullody. And uh, Father John, we've heard uh, a lot of information today. Uh, we know that our faith community is very important now to all of our communities uh, in Southeastern Mass. And what can you say to viewers that will be helpful to them at this time? Well, not to minimize the uh, difficult dark days that we're involved in at the present moment, but I always try to find, if you can, a silver lining. And maybe one thing we've discovered is how much we do need one another. <coughs> and we've already given a shout out to uh, the first responders, the medical profession, the psychologists, the people that are really helping behind the scenes to alleviate some of the stress and anxiety and the physical problems that people are facing. Uh, hopefully, we can continue that spirit uh, down the line. And to remember, there are a lot of organizations that continue to reach out to help people that are homeless, people are struggling with addictions, people are struggling with personal issues. They go on day in, day out, not just in times of crisis. And perhaps when we get beyond the present moment, if we can be one of those people that helps others, that can kind of use a little bit of our spare time or some of our talents and resources to be a of assistance to another, what a great gift that would be. And, and that would be perhaps the silver lining that comes out of this very dark and difficult time in our history. Thank you, Father John Cullody. I'd like to thank all of our guests, Congressman Bill Keating and uh, Michael Jackman from his staff, Representatives Matthew Muratori, Kathleen Lenatra, and Josh Cutler, and also Drs. Philip Trifletti, Dr. Mark Wilson, and Dr. Russell Fry. Uh, as well as Father John Cullody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator, and we'll continue to present forums for you uh, as we respond uh, to COVID-19. Thank you and good day.